Welcome to SPC Insights with Dr. Bill, simplifying SPC and statistical analysis. This video is going to take a look at one technique for measurement systems analysis. Why do we take measurements? We want to know if the process is staying the same, if it's improving, or if it's getting worse. So to know if a measurement's useful, we first have to evaluate our process. And there's a series of techniques for evaluating processes called EMP, or eva evaluating the measurement process. These techniques were developed by Dr. Donald Wheeler, and one of those is called the short EMP study. And it's one operator running multiple parts, multiple times, it's similar to a gauge in r and analysis, but only one operator. And then based on the results, it's going to tell us many things, including if the measurement process can tell the difference between the parts. So in this video, we're going to start with an introduction to the short EMP study, give an overview of the steps, show the example data. We're going to have one operator measuring 10 parts three times, analyze the results, and then determine percent variance to the measurement system and to the product. And then based on those, we're going to get additional insights from the study based on Dr. Wheeler's classification system. So let's start with an introduction to the short EMP study. It's one operator only, measuring multiple parts, multiple times. The subgroups are formed. Each subgroup is composed of the results for one part. You calculate the subgroup averages and ranges. Then you plot the results on an X bar and R control chart along with the calculated averages and control limits. Then you analyze the charts and you determine the percent variances due to the measurement system and product. And based on these values, the measurement system is classified. And then you get additional insights based on that classification Dr. Wheeler developed. So let's start with an example of the short EMP study. We have 10 parts we've got representing the variation in our process. We measure a quality characteristic, and here are the results. Each subgroup number represents a part, so part one was measured three times, that's subgroup one. Part two measured three times, that's subgroup two, and so forth. And this is the data we're gonna use in our analysis. So continuing with our example, we're going to begin by taking a look at the range control charts. So what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the subgroup ranges using the R control chart. Then we're going to analyze the subgroup averages using the X bar control chart. So let's start with the range values. The subgroup range for subgroup 1, highlighted in yellow here, is simply the maximum minus the minimum for that subgroup for part 1. So the maximum is 11.46, the minimum is 10.67. You take a difference, and the range for our first subgroup is 0 0.79. Now we want to think about that range for a little bit. Okay, it's 0 0.79 for the first subgroup. What causes a variation in the results in subgroup 1? Why aren't they the same all the time? The same part is used, so it's not part to part result. Well, the variation is simply due to measurement error or the test retest error. So that's important. The range is simply the measurement error. It's the variation in the measurement. And then you calculate the subgroup ranges for all subgroups. Then you're going to plot the results on the R control chart. So you take each subgroup range, you plot it on the chart. So we plot all 10 on the chart, and you calculate the subgroup range. It's 0.49. You plot that and you plot the control limits, and it's 1.26. And here are the equations for, for calculating the control limits. So then you're going to interpret the range chart. Are there any points beyond the limits? Any patterns? No, there's not. So this range chart is in statistical control, and since it's in control, you can estimate the measurement error. So to calculate the measurement error from the R chart, it's simply the average range divided by a control chart constant that depends on subgroup size. In this case, that's D2, it's 1.693 for a subgroup size of 3. So you can do the calculations and you get the measurement error of 0 0.29. So that's a measure of your variation in the measurement process. Now note if the R chart's out of control, you're going to have to five and find and remove those special causes of variation, and then you have to repeat the short EMP study. Now we're going to move to the X bar control charts, and the, res the results for each subgroup are averaged for subgroup number one. The average is 11.13. You do that for all the charts, and then you plot those averages on the X bar chart. So here we see the results, and then you're going to calculate your average, 
and the, calc the uh, equation shown here, and you're going to calculate your control limits with the equation shown here. X double bar is the average, K is the number of subgroups that we have, A2 is a control chart constant that depends on subgroup size. And in this case, our subgroup size is 3, so our, we're at 1.023 for a subgroup size of 3. Now take a look at the control limits for the subgroup averages. You'll see they're based on the average range. And where did we get that range? Where did that range come from? Well, the average range is based on the measurement system variation. It doesn't include the part-to-part -part variation, so you're hoping the measurement system's variation is small and the control limits on this chart are tight, which means you want the points to be out of control. Remember, control limits are based on the measurement system error, so you hope the measurement error is less than the variation between the part error averages. There should be out of control points on the X chart, and they sure are on this chart. And the more you have, the better. And we have six out of control points there. So let's look at the measurement error impact on variation in part averages. The width between the control limits is the part variation that's obscured by measurement error, which means between the control limits, all the variation you're seeing is due to measurement error. Variation in the parts is given by the difference in the maximum and minimum subgroup averages. And so remember now, what we're looking at is we're comparing the part variation to the measurement system variation. So the width represented by the variation of the subgroup averages show how the parts vary. And you want that part variation to be greater than the width obscured by measurement error. So you take a look at this chart, and it's true. The measurement system can tell the difference between the parts because the part variation is much larger than the measurement system variation. So this example can tell the difference between the parts. But let's take a look at, a, at the mathematics to figure out the relationship between the variances. The total variance of the product measurements is equal to the variance of the product plus the variance of the measurement system. And we're going to use this equation to help determine the percent of total variance due to the measurement system as well as the percent of total variance due to the product. Two ratios that we're going to take a look at. We start with the ratio of the product variance to the total variance. We're going to call that rho. And then we're also interested in the ratio of the measurement system to the total variance. And rho is what we're going to call the inner class correlation coefficient. We're going to use that to help rate this, the measurement system. So let's start. We have to calculate the product variance. There are a number of ways of doing that. This equation uses the pooled variance of the part averages, and that, that product variance is 1.029. The measurement system variance is simply the square of the measurement error we got earlier, the square of 0.29, and the total variance is simply the sum of those two, the product variance plus the measurement system variance. And we can use these numbers then to come up with our percentages. So this shows our percentages where you take the measurement variance divided by the total variance and it gives you the percent of uh, variance due to the measurement system, that's 7.56%. Repeat that for the product, that's 92.44%. But the question is, is this a good measurement system? How do we know? Dr. Wheeler answers that question for us in terms of how good is my measurement system by the classification system he put together for measurement processes. It puts the measurement process into one of four classes based on the following. Percent of variance due to the product variance, how much the measurement system reduces the strength of a signal on a control chart, the chance of catching a large shift on a control chart, and the ability of the measurement system to track future process improvements. Let's take a more in-depth look at these key insights. The first column is the percent of total variance due to the product variance. This actually gives you the type of monitor. The next column is the reduction of process signal, and we'll see how that changes depending on the type of monitor you have. Then you have the chance of detecting a large shift on your control chart and how that changes depending on your type of monitor. And then finally, the ability to track future process improvements and what impact that has 
uh, as you improve your processes. In this example, row is 92.44%, so it's a first class monitor. It's the best you have. And then what's that really mean? And these other three columns are gonna help us tell that, tell us that. So this is really a more precise system for rating a measurement system than the methods used in traditional gauge R&R. &R. The third column is the reduction of a process signal. Measurement system variation reduces a signal on a control chart for being out of control. But with a first class monitor, it's less than 10%. Reduction in process with a fourth class, it's already more than 55% uh, reduction. So you can see that as a type of monitor decreases from first to fourth class, there's a definite reduction in performance. Now, this is a chance of detecting a three standard error shift. Rule one is points beyond the control limits. Rules two, three, and four are Western Electric Zones tests. And you can see you have a 99% chance with rule one of detecting that large shift. So first class is very, very good. Fourth class, you really can't. And then the last is the ability to track process improvements. This is something we don't think a lot about, but what happens as you improve your process, reduce variation in your process. What happens to the variation due to the measurement system? Well, what happens is the percent of total of variation due to the percent of variation due to the measurement system, it increases by the percent of variation due to the product decreases. And what happens then is your monitor moves from a one class to a lower class. So this describes how much process improvement you can have until the measurement system moves from one to the other. So in this video, what we've done is taken a look at the EMP study. We introduced the short study. We had one operator measuring multiple parts multiple times. Use the X bar and R chart for the initial analysis. It gives us a picture of measurement system variation versus part variation. How much is obscured by the measurement system. Calculate our percent variances and use the classification scheme. You're going to need more information on the classification scheme. Please feel free to see our SPC knowledge base where we have over 30 articles just on measurement systems analysis. Click on the YouTube subscribe button below. Appreciate it. You can download our demo and do your own short EMP study. We appreciate you taking the time to watch the video. Thank you.